Welcome, everybody. This is our How I Made It lecture series. This is the final one of the semester, and um, this is a really is one I always look forward to myself because I feel I have a entrepreneur inside of me. Um, one of these days, I'll tell my stories of how I made it, but I'm not an entrepreneur now. So, um, so I'm really excited to hear from these three women who are here sharing about their businesses, and um, the topic is. Uh, entrepreneurs, people who started their business with little or no money. So I would like to um, just encourage you to share that part of your story with us. And um, what we'll do is I'll introduce each of them. They'll have a chance to share their story. And then when each of them have um, talked, after each of them have talked, we'll do some question and answer. So um, this is Melissa Marston. She has Lucky Penny Press. Uh, which is an online publisher of children's books. And I've known Melissa for a long time. She's worked um, in a bunch of different um, occupations in the community, as have I. And I can't wait to hear her story, so I'm not going to bother introducing her anymore. That's it. <laughs> so as um, my company is Lucky Penny Press, um, it's a it's now a website to download children's picture books for all for iPhones, iPads, Macs, PCs. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, a little bit about my background, and how I got to where Lucky Penny Press is today. So I've told this story to many friends and family, but this is honestly my first public presentation of the story. So it'll be good to get feedback as well. Um, and just in case any of you are authors or illustrators, we are looking for new works. If you have a children's book or if you're um, artists, um, I'm looking for a new new artist as well. So, and there may be, I am looking for tech help too. So that's a possibility. Um, and there, I just want to tell you a little bit about my background and then how I got to where Lucky Penny is today. Um, there are two things I've always known about myself from elementary school. I knew that I wanted to be a writer. From second grade on, I've always loved to write. Um, and I remember, it's funny, I remember all my even school English teachers I've saved many, many things um, from my writing. And then when I was a junior in high school, I found out that I absolutely love to run. And so all along my career, I've tried, they've been the two constants, actually, the running and writing I've had throughout my life. And they've always been there for me. And then as I've gone along in my career, I've tried to figure out ways to merge those two. Um, so I have a little bit of a quirky background in, I was a classic, classical Greek major. Um, I majored in classical Greek and art history, and I've always been fascinated by ancient civilizations. So that fascination comes up a little bit later in my career, and it had a little bit to do with how I started Lucky Penny. Um, but after I graduated from college, I went to college on the East Coast, and I moved to New York City. And all my friends were going to finance. I grew up with a father who was a banker, and I didn't want that, you know. So I got involved in nonprofit, and my first job out of college was raising money for the first youth hostel in New York City. It was a million dollar campaign. I didn't, know, I didn't even know grant writing was a career. So I started writing grant proposals. A year later, I got an offer to work on a $20 million campaign, my second year out of college, writing grant proposals, writing grant proposals. Two years later, I end up in Santa Barbara, took a job as the executive director of the Children's Museum. The executive director, and I took a 50% pay cut. <laughs> And so I worked, I've worked in nonprofit here probably about 15 years, mostly doing grant writing. And um, then there's, there's just a time in my life when I just needed a change. I just wanted to do something different, but I didn't know exactly what it was. But I knew I had my running, I knew I had my writing. And so I did a search, a Google search, and I searched um, marathons. Machu Picchu, Peru, and I came up with a marathon along the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, and it was about six years ago. I went by myself with a group and um, ran the marathon, and um, while I was down there, the manager of the hotel gave me this little bear, and so um, on the plane right back, I wrote a children's book called Pablito and the Speckled Bear, and I actually wrote another children's book on the plane right back. So, you know, I just had them on my computer, just, you know, sitting there. Um, and I decided to quit fundraising, quit my nonprofit, and I joined the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And then I started to pursue getting my book, my manuscript, published by Random House, Scholastic, 
you know, I was going to children's book writing conferences, I was going to workshops, I'd send my manuscript, I'd get rejections. I didn't want to be Dr. Seuss and wait like 45, you know, get 45 rejections. So I said, I'm going to do it by myself. So, you know, I had in my head that I was going to self-publish my own book. And um, coincidentally, I used to run up on Mountain Drive, and there used to be a sculpture up on Mountain Drive, and this artist illustrator who illustrates for the independent, his name's Ben Sabati, would do these illustrations, and I would look at him and like, oh, he would make a great children's book illustrator. And I, one day on my run, I met him. I actually met him. I said, I want you to do my book. And so we were in the midst of putting illustrations together for this book. Then, three years ago, this past weekend, I lost my house in the tea fire. And Ben did too. So the two of us lost our homes in the tea fire. Um, I actually evacuated with my bear. I had, I had an hour to pack. I had been um, on a run an hour before the fire um, with my 13-year-old son at the time. We got back, you know, it was about 5.30. 6 o'clock, get a call. I look out my back door and my friend said, did you know there's a fire? And I could see the fire. And so I went around the house running, pulling things, and my son packed. And um, I actually also grabbed a CD with five of Ben's illustrations. That was by my telephone at the front door. Um, you know, we were able to get some clothes, some photos. So we were pretty lucky to have an hour to pack. After the fire, a friend of mine said, you know, I want to help you do something. You know, is there anything I can help you with? I'm really good at technology. And um, I said, you know, I want to self-publish my book. And he's like, I can help you with that. And so Ben had done five of the illustrations. And so over, this is um, three years ago. So during the next six to eight months, Ben did about eight to 12 more illustrations. And then it was a year after the fire, I came out with Pablito and the Speckled Bear. We printed these on iBooks. There, are, um, I printed a hundred, and they're forty-five dollars a piece. You know, I was lucky. I did have some fire insurance money, so that's how I funded it. And so what I did is I went around to some of the bookstores, um, Tecolote, Chaucer's, Bennett's, um, and Wendy Foster took the book. But they sold it for nineteen ninety-five. So I go, okay, this is not a very good business. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, it's costing me more to sell it. But the thing that came out of it, the really cool thing, is I had a book signing at the Billmore Hotel, and then the Independent did a story. And then I had the hardcover version to give to my nephews and, you know, give to friends. So I had other books on my hard drive. You know, other people thought it was like, oh, that's so cool that you did that. I want to do a book. And it was right about that time. So that was November 09 and March, no, so yeah. So March 2010, I think it was. It was about the time the Kindles were, the Kindle had come out. And I was looking at the Kindle and I just didn't understand why the Kindle was not, why it was black and white and not color. So I just thought it just didn't make sense to me. And so I just kind of kept thinking it was percolating in my head and then the iPad came out. And then another friend came to me and said, well, I'm good, I can make an app for you. So from last year, from about March 2010 to November, a year ago, we had an app approved by Apple. Um, we had eight books up with audio and with Spanish language, Spanish, French, and Chinese translations. And I'm actually also looking for translators of languages. So that's another thing we are looking for. Um, we, so this past May, we had our best book come up. It was called Rex the Cat. It was about a displaced cat from one of the fires. One of the moms at Marymount had written this story um, about Rex the Cat, and we had gotten J.R.R. Tolkien's granddaughter, the guy who wrote Lord of the Rings, his granddaughter had done the audio. So that was May of this past year, and then my app went down. It got a bug in it, and we have not been able to figure out what happened. And so, okay, again, starting business, can't get discouraged, perseverance, you know, long distance running, okay, gotta keep going. So, um, yet another person came into my life, who an old friend, um, who 
ended up saying, okay, well, we're gonna recreate the website. The website was just informational. It didn't have anything on it, just information, how to submit, what Lucky Penny with Press was about. So during the past five months, we reconfigured the website, and now on November 1st of this year, we had our first book available. We had our second book available last week, and our goal is to have 12 books by the end of the year. And what's the best thing about this is that Apple doesn't take any of the money. You know, you pay on PayPal, we retain all the profits. And so the goal right now is just to start uploading the books. And so all the books that were on the app, we're just converting them over to the website right now. And then just looking for new books, new material. Um, I can answer questions about um, you know, our submission guidelines, which are on the website. Um, I have kind of a chicken soup, chicken soup for the soul theme, kind of inspirational, adventure, um, you know, educational, nature, environment. So those are some of the themes. Um, so what also happens, we, this is a local author. She printed 1,500 of her book. So what we've been able to do, she's done. She finished her book, but we can take her illustrations and her text and put it on the website. And then what she also had, she had a French translation, but she'd never seen it together. So we took her illustrations and took the French translation. And then in the midst, we've had it translated into Spanish. We're having it translated into Chinese. So um, one of my goals for Lucky Penny is for to market it to American families living abroad who aren't getting books, and then also to be able to, you know, work on their languages when they're abroad. So that's one possible. One possibility. Um, I just wanted to show you the other. If we don't have a hardcover version, then we just. This is a little Ghanaian folk tale that we're working on. And it actually, my son, when he was in seventh grade, wrote an adorable story. And so this is an illustrator who's um, a sophomore in college. So she's on the East Coast. She sends me illustrations. So we're working that way. And then um, all the books are $3.99. And when we add the audio, they'll be $4.99. And so the authors and illustrators get a percentage. And then on top of that, I've been inspired by Tom Shoes. I don't know if you've all heard of him, who um, for every pair of shoes that he sells, he donates a pair. So one of the goals with Lucky Penny is every book will be connected to a nonprofit. So then a nonprofit will benefit. Um, so I brought some information about my suggestions and things that I've learned. Um, I have, you know, I, I've obviously explained some of the setbacks, and that's um, a little bit about Lucky Penny Press. Thank you. That was awesome, Melissa. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to follow my own directions and wait. So now I'm going to introduce our next presenter. This is Rachel Steidel. And um, she, I can't wait to hear about your business because I feel like I, even though I use it, I don't fully understand it. So I she, cre oh. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> that's worse for you than for me. Um, so she created, um, I was going to say Lucky Penny Press. She created mm -hmm. Parent Click, right. which actually which was started originally SB Parent. SB yeah. Parent. Okay, so I remember when it was SB Parent. And was it also a magazine? No, it's always been online. It's always but been we've online. Print things we've done throughout the years. Okay, yes. okay, and now it's Parent Click, which she will t talk about more. It's an online community, and it's in 18 different cities, if I'm not mistaken. So, yes. so I'd love to hear your okay. story. Thank you, Rachel. I started, we are going to actually have our 10-year anniversary in April, which is, um, time's gone really fast. I have three children, 13-year-old uh, twins and a 9-year-old, and I mark the anniversary every year because we officially launched Parent Click when my uh, daughter was a newborn, my youngest. And um, I started it because at the time, I, I grew up in Santa Barbara, I took classes up at City College, um, and I was in several parenting groups, and um, because I was one of the people who was originally from Santa Barbara, I was the go-to person on finding new resources for her families. But by the time my toddlers were getting ready to go to preschool, I was looking at all of these moms doing the exact same labor work 
to try to get information for their families. We were all going to visit the same preschools. We were all asking the same questions. And it just seemed duplicitous that um, everybody had to go through this much work to do everything. So I started looking and, and uh, started talking to the groups I was in about putting together a book, thinking that would be make the most sense. And again, this was 10 years ago when the internet was um, much harder to navigate. And I realized very quickly that resources change rapidly and daily. And so that if I really wanted to make this effective, we needed to go online. So I spent about a year um, while I was pregnant looking at this idea, putting it together, everybody patting me on the head and saying what a cute idea, and trying to figure out how to launch a website. I had no background in technology. Um, my background is um, in management. I have a degree in clinical psychology, and um, but I have always worked. I've always loved working. I've done a lot of internships over the years, and I, when I was going to school, I got my master's in clinical psych, but I spent a lot of time working in fields that were unrelated so that I could just find, um, that I found for me, I found different sides of myself and things that I was good at. So when I looked at doing this, although I had never written a business plan, although I had no startup funding, although I had three children at home and um, no experience in technology, I felt very strongly that it was something that parents needed. Um, I also did grow up in a family of entrepreneurs, so I've watched people put their heart into things and succeed at them. And so I just felt like, regardless of what happened with it down the road, even if it ended up just being a community service, I was going to go for it. So um, I put together the whole website, and um, pretty much right after my daughter was born, I decided either I'm going to do this or I'm going to scrap it all. I worked with a, I took a web design class, realized very quickly that I couldn't wear that hat and try to grow a business at the same time, so I hired a web developer to build it. and. Um, we launched the site and I sent out about 400 letters to um, local businesses, um, encouraging them to advertise on it. I got zero responses. <laughs> and, um, and the thing is, when you're starting a new business, you think you've got everything figured out. Well, parents want this, businesses are gonna want it. And I had two goals in mind. One was to give parents choices. I felt really strongly that in the parenting community, um, everybody's opinions are put on you. And that has to do with everything from birthing to breastfeeding to where your kids go to school to what have you. And I felt like parents need to be able to make have everything in front of them so they can make choices for themselves and what works best for their family. My other goal when I started researching how do we do advertising on the site was realizing how expensive it is for organizations to advertise in our community and really anywhere. And it is um, what really was open and mind-boggling for me actually was looking at the phone book advertising. And to have a small advertisement in the phone book was just astronomical. So I put together um, a spreadsheet and figured out all the pricing and decided our second goal was that we were gonna be an affordable way that any business, big or small, <coughs> any nonprofit could advertise with us. And we were gonna call them listings. Our goal was not to be a flashy website, our goal was to be content-based. So I spent a lot of time researching websites and deciding what I liked and didn't like on websites. And what I found was a lot of websites, even to this day, are full of advertisements, but they're not content rich. So that has been and will continue to be our first goal. So we um, didn't get a response from that. And so for startup, what we did is I borrowed $3,000 from a family member. And um, this family member happened to be my grandfather, who was willing to do it just to support me. I have a wonderful husband who said he was um, He's a scientist. He doesn't get the entrepreneurial thinking or starting a business, but he knew that I needed to do this. So he was okay with me doing it. And um, I worked part time to actually fund it. And really what I was funding was childcare so that I could really put the time into starting a business. And within a year and a half, we were actually making money. Um, it took me four years though before I actually wrote myself a paycheck. And during that four years, I had a very good friend who helped keep all my books. For the first year, I was stuffing everything basically into envelopes because I really, money has never motivated me for doing business. Yes, we need it. Yes, um, I needed the site to pay for itself. But I have found, and I have watched a lot of businesses now come and go over the last 10 years, that people who get into anything just for the money are not very often gonna be successful. You look at people like Steve Jobs, he was successful because he believed in what he was doing. He started off in a garage, um, 
most of us um, who start businesses, I, I remember when I first started people going, aren't you afraid people are going to steal your concept and there's all these other sites that are competition to yours. I feel really strongly that every business has their own unique niche and you need to find your own unique niche when you're starting a business. And if you look at everybody as competition, you're not going to succeed. If you look at people and you say, what is it that we are, what is it that we're doing differently than them? How can we partner with them? How can we complement each other? You're gonna be more successful. And especially in a community like Santa Barbara. And when we launched um, what was SP Parent, our goal is to market in the community, not market online. Marketing online is great, and it needs, you wanna come up in search engines and, engines and all that's important, but for what we were doing, I wanted people to see us as a storefront, not as, we all know what it's like to go on a website and not even be able to find a contact person, is there even a real person behind this? So we put a lot into local marketing, and in doing that, we also decided that we didn't wanna spend a lot on just generic advertising or marketing materials. We really wanted to do it. We're in a very nonprofit centric community. So we put it into sponsoring events. So we sponsor everything from the smallest little, uh, you know, preschool carnival up to we've helped sponsor the, you know, International Film Festival and other big events in Santa Barbara because that gets us out in the community. We get to support events in our community. We get visibility because we are in their programs, our logos, different places. And then people know we really are part of Santa Barbara. Um, two years into starting SB Parent, we started getting calls from other um, communities asking how they could do this in their, in their uh, cities. So what we decided to do at the time, because I didn't want to manage um, all of it, we started licensing the technology. So what we essentially did is we built these same sites in other communities and we ended up being a support system for these people launching the sites. And the problem is, and what's one of the things you learn along the way, is that I felt so strongly about being unique to our community that I told everybody they should absolutely name their sites something different than what we had named ours. So it was all about their community. Well, it makes it very hard for branding. So ParentClick, even after eight years, two years ago, um, I had a ParentClick sticker on the back of my car and somebody came up to me and said, you have competition. Did you know there's a ParentClick site here now too? I said, well, actually that's us. But we had done such a, good job of making sure that nobody ever thought saw us as a company that we never brought up our um, business name parent click so uh, about two years ago we decided we were going to relaunch our site very expensive um, endeavor and um, we were going to relaunch it we've already had rebuilt the site about five times but it was really um, building on what we already had this time we were going to do a brand new launch put a lot more into social um, marketing social media and networking and um, in doing that, we decided we were gonna put all of our community sites under one domain, and we were gonna rebrand as ParentClick. So in January, we relaunched the site, and that's what we're doing, and now we hire our editors in all of our communities, and we are overseeing all of it so that there's quality control, and uh, essentially, we've launched a new business model, so we're working out all the bugs with that, and it's been an adventure, and um, I have to say, I love what I do. I. When you own your own business, you don't work less, you work harder than you'll ever work, but you set your own hours. You know, for me, I knew that I wanted to be able to work in my kids' classrooms if I needed to, volunteer at things still, um, and it allows me to do it. It also means that I'm up till two in the morning sometimes working, and I am have very odd schedules sometimes, but you get to, put, everything you do is for something you love. And I have to say, if you're going to work that hard, you've got to love it. And you've got to love wearing multiple hats and you've got to be willing to um, wear different hats. And um, just one last thing I was gonna share is just the biggest learning curve I think I've had in the last two years is that for me, I wanted to work every aspect of my business as it was growing because I truly wanted to understand every part of it. But I think for us um, and where we're looking at um, growing next is um, creating advisory boards and hiring other people in because at some point you also want to bring in people who are better at what you do than what than you are and you can't continue to try to do every job and you hopefully want to bring people on who have a much better knowledge base especially when you're dealing with technology and marketing and sales and all of these different things so that's <coughs> it thanks Rachel. okay thank you there. Come on up. <clears throat>
Our next presenter is probably going to be your favorite just because she brought chocolate. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yes, <what I> do. <laughs> um, this is Jill Marie Carré, and she has a chocolate. She, you're a chocolatier. No, my husband is okay, a chocolatier. Your husband is the I chocolatier. I'm the official taster, which is a much better oh, job. Oh, much better <laughs> job, yes. Yeah. And they have two retail um, stores in town now, one in Carpinteria and one in um, downtown Santa Barbara, and it's Cali. Chocolat de Calais du Chocolat Bresson. De, Chocolat de Calais Bresson. And I'll explain that name to you um, when I get started here. Okay. okay. Can I help you? Can I help you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to say, <clears throat> I don't know how many we are here, but these are boxes of 24. So I there's 48 we'll pieces. So, so nobody take two. So yes. Huh? <laughs> and um, oh my there gosh. will be, um, I think if we start one in the back and one in the front on both sides and there. I'll, I'll, I'll handle this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there are some brochures. Kristen, you want to take some of the brochures as well? And I'll, um, I'll sure. Leave. So that will explain uh, what some of those are. So hello, everybody. Again, my name is Jill Marie and um, Carré. My husband is Jean-Michel Carré. And I, not like these lovely ladies, I have no technical um, background. I have no high level of college background. I come from a family who are not entrepreneurs. I come from um, uh, where the best thing I want to do was get out of the house when I turned 18 and just get out. And what to do in that was to find a job. I, my first job was 15 years old. I got to work in a uh, um, an A&W root beer where they did the roller skates and all that. So my career was set. I was going to be in the food industry and I always was in restaurants. I did, I've done everything in restaurants. I've done everything. And um, I love people. I love being around people and this worked for me. And at my age, um, which I'm not 20 anymore, but um, restaurants were very easy to get jobs like that. You could get them and leave them and get them and leave them. So for what I wanted in my life to be able to move, and which I did, I traveled and I worked everywhere. So I was in the restaurant business. After about, um, probably about 29 years old, I said, you know, I'm kind of tired of this lifestyle because you're up till two o'clock in the morning. You, you work at night. I mean, if you want to work and make some money, you work the night shift. And I got tired of being in the night shift. So I said, what am I gonna do so I can get into like a regular life, hours? So I went back to hair school. And so I went to hair school and I got my license and I opened a hair salon with three other girls. So I did that for 10 years and I met a French man who came from France to work in a French restaurant of someone that I knew. And he was a chef de cuisine. And so of course I met this guy in what maybe Four months later, I was married to him. If someone told me at 35 years old, I was going to be married, I would say, you're crazy because I'm not interested. Not that I was never going to get married. I just wasn't in the plan. I had a business going. and So anyway, I was married to him. And after four years in San Diego, because I met him in California, I, um, I, we discussed what we were going to do. Are we going to stay here and him continue to work in a restaurant and me have the hair salon? Or do you want to move back to France? So we decided we'd move back to France. I, know new, I knew no French at all, and another adventure, it was wonderful, so we moved to France. We didn't know what we would, get, we, we would do. In the long run, we wanted to open a restaurant, because after all those 10 years of getting out of the restaurant business, here I marry somebody who throws me back into the restaurant business, not by choice, of course by choice, because it's what we both knew. And so we moved back to France, and um, he was going to stay with me, take a job, uh, at uh, during the day so he could be with me in the evening and teach help teach me friends well I'll tell you it's like having your husband teach you how to drive you know it just doesn't work you don't learn French from your husband so what I did uh, he wound up taking a job that took him he opened up a hotel and a restaurant uh, they were in the process of building it and they hired him to come in and do the do the kitchen part so he was gone day and night which left me in France no French on my own it was great. It was the best thing I ever did. I learned French. Every time I walked out that door, I had to learn the language or I'd be stuck inside watching American TV, which was not my point at all. So I learned the language. My first job was a month later. I got a job in an exercise pool 
teaching exercises. All I had to do was count up to 30 and then start all over again, you know, so that was great. And then the next season, because I was, I was, um, I had started my paperwork, but I was not a French citizen. I am now a French citizen and I'm an American citizen. I have duo citizenship, but at the time, so I would work in this little village, Samir and Oxwar, it's near Dijon in between Paris and, and Dijon. Where we, that's where we wound up living. And uh, so, um, I forgot my train of thought. Job, I was working every season. Every season I got a new job in a different place. I worked in, a, in an exercise place. I worked in a, a bar. I worked in a hair salon. I worked, you know, all of that to get me another level of language, which was great. It was new dialogue every place I went. Also learning my driver's license because the thing with French and America, if I came from Florida, I wouldn't have had to take my driver's license over, but coming from California, I had to. It was the greatest thing I ever did because the room was open. I, had a, I could go in any time for however long I wanted, look at the, the diagrams and the videos of all of the scenarios of the car situations in French, and I was learning French all day long. It was great. Anyway, so we, for four years, Jean-Michel worked in a restaurant. I did all these odds and ends because our goal was to open a restaurant. I needed to learn how to speak this language if I'm going to answer phones and do this. So that's what we did. We opened a restaurant. It took us a while because, you know, you think you have 35 years behind you of restaurant business. No matter what business you do, don't ever take it for granted. Banks will say that's really nice, that's great, it looks good on the resume and everything, but when you want to get money for a loan, you need to really be creative and uh, you have to be persistent you have to be persistent we wound up opening our restaurant we bought an old building of course all buildings in france are old but we bought this building that was older than the united states it was wonderful it was not a restaurant it was empty it had the the cove below where we started digging out and it turned out to be like the the exit way for all the monks when they were invaded in the villages and so it had great history it was wonderful it was four levels and we lived on top we had our apartment on top and we had we created the restaurant down below. It was wonderful. We did that for, uh, let's see, we had the restaurant for 14 years. And during that 14 years, it was wonderful. It was a success, hard work. Restaurant business, any business is hard. But you, like she was saying, you have to know every <coughs> angle of your business. I had to clean toilets. I had to do everything. I had to know how to do that because I have people that didn't show up to work. What do you do? You do it. You do it. You don't go, what am I going to do? Close the door. You don't close the door. You do it. And you have to know how to do it all. You have to know how to do it all. So it's a lot of work. Restaurant business, like any business, you're putting a lot of hours. We're getting up at 4, going to bed at 2. You have a break in between the two. But what do you do? You do paperwork. You do your ordering. You do whatever. Maybe you get off your feet you know, for a couple hours, but you're still working. Um, after... Oh, we did 14 years. After about 12 years, I was really missing California. I was missing California. I was missing the sun. We lived in Burgundy. Beautiful, but it's kind of like on the same level as Seattle. So, you know, beautiful green and, and <coughs> wonderful. But it's, again, being in a restaurant, living on top, there were weeks I never even got out. You know, I mean, really. You live in a small village, you can walk to the store. You walk everywhere. It's wonderful. The bread was right across the way. You, you know, they're making the baguettes and you're going to get them. And, you know, it's great, but you never get out. And uh, I was missing some sun, I was missing California, and I was also missing the language, you know? I can speak French and everything, but you know, you kind of miss some American lingo, you know? It's just different. And uh, so our, our plan then was to sell the restaurant. We were both getting tired of restaurant business. We would come back to California to visit and see where we wanted to be when we came back and what we wanted to do. And so at the time, we came to San Santa Barbara looking around we were thinking of another restaurant at that time. So when we came to visit, we looked and, you know, we looked all in doubt. But Santa Barbara attracted us. And I'm originally from down south, and we originally left San Diego to go to France, but we always were pulled back in this direction. But anyway, we said, let's put the restaurant up for sale. It took us four years. I tell you, that was the hardest four years of my life. I wanted to come back so bad. And so, you know, it was just, it was hard to sell it. You're selling a house and a business. And it's not separate because you don't want to come back and worry about the apartment. You want to be able to sell it all and go back. So that's what we did. We sold everything, took us four years, and then we came back to, we actually landed in San, uh, San Diego, and it took us a year to go, 
from San, San Diego to Napa Valley to check out and see what we wanted to do. We closed our restaurant November 19th of 206 and we gave ourselves one year to relocate and reopen another business. That was our goal. And after coming back and searching up and down and seeing where we wanted to live, deciding that it was going to be a chocolate boutique and not a restaurant, because Jean-Michel always made chocolate, but he only sold it at Christmas time. But that would get us out of the restaurant business into something that was still <coughs> creative. And I'm out of the restaurant business, but you know that was great. That was great. We thought the hours would be a little different. They are different, but we still put in the same amount of hours. We still put in a lot of hours. Again, you have to love what you do. Jean-Michel has patience of steel. He loves what he does. Those chocolates will prove his patience. They are not only beautiful to look at, but they are all different and they're all just delicious. They're all just Fabulous. wonderful. Absolutely. So anyway, so that's what we decided to do. And we found a place in Carpinteria because here we're new from France. No one knows us. No one has any idea of what we do or who we are. And there's other chocolate places. I checked out all of the competition all over. And um, so we had to do something that was going to be different. And we also had to get our weight. We had to get our feet in the ground and, and start it. So we found a place in Carpinteria. So people always go, why are you not downtown? You're in a business park. People, you know, they don't know where you are. They Now after four years, people know where we are and it's good. But in the beginning, no one knew who we were. They were going downtown and when they, we didn't get any walk-in traffic at all. But what we did is we got the back space, which is a kitchen space, and that's what we needed. We needed a big kitchen space with a little front that would be our storefront. That's what we did. We opened it, and within a period of three years, four years, we were able to open up a second shop. So persistence, you have to love what you do, and um, we're going strong in Carpinteria. Just since May, we've been in uh, La Arcada, in State and Figueroa, and it's a totally different feel because it's just retail and it's more elegant. And the other shop is more kitchen, but we have a nice elegant front. But um, in four years in this economy, we've been able to open two stores and um, a, lot of, a lot of perseverance, a lot of belief in yourself and um, have other people believe you too. And so you give away a lot of chocolate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to have you all just come up and kind of be in the hot seat. And, um, and I know that I have some questions, and I'm sure that um, the students here have questions as well. So I think you should sit by your bear. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, you can sit or stand or whatever. And um, does anybody have a question right off the bat? Or can I ask all of mine? Okay, go ahead. I have a question for Melissa. You said you were into grant writing, and I'm curious what that is. Oh, grant for nonprofits. Um, nonprofits raise a lot of their money from writing grant proposals to companies, foundations, governments. It's actually a really good way to make money. And um, up until the time of the fire, even when I had stopped, when I was pursuing most of my writing, I was doing consulting because a lot of nonprofits need grant writers. Um, but in October 08, with the recession, um, I had lost a job then at that time. And um, yeah, I'm, you know, I haven't pursued it, but just with the economy being the way it is, it's a lot harder to get money for these nonprofits. Um, but there are online classes for grant writing. It pays great. Um, so. It's, does that answer your question? Yeah. It's a way to raise money for nonprofits. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Where is your shop on, on State Street? It's, it, it's in uh, La Arcada. It is State and Figueroa. And there, here it is. There's on the well, back. thank you. You're welcome. It's mm -hmm. Fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the primary um, focus for parents when they go on there is the business directory. And so for Santa Barbara, for instance, we have over 2,200 businesses and nonprofits listed on there. And then the other big part of the site is the calendar. So um, we try to list every event and activity that's going on in Santa Barbara, both for families as a whole, but also just for adults going out um, as well. But 
one of the things we realized when we were doing this a couple years into it is that parents still need, we still needed people to go onto the site and know other ways to drive traffic. So we added a classified section so parents can buy and sell things for free on the site. We have a ton of UCSB students and City College students actually who use it to promote their babysitting services. And then we have a chatter area where parents can um, share information and um, businesses can post press releases. So. While we're talking to you, Rachel, I'm curious what your business model is in, in terms of like, for me, these online businesses, it's always slightly mysterious how they make money. So like, where does your, how do you make money? <laughs> um, so the, the base of what we do, and, and uh, actually this was really interesting when we were developing our other communities because um, Businesses and nonprofits can list as low as $60 for the year on our site, which is not a lot of money. And you need a lot of people to make that sustain itself. But what I saw in the first year and what my part of my business plan was, we have more expensive ways for people to market with doing banner ads, which can be anywhere up to you know $4,500 a year. Um, a lot of our um, other uh, community sites were putting so much more energy into their banner ad advertising and their sponsors because they saw the big dollar signs. And what I kept telling everybody is if you start small and you build up this base, you will have these repeat customers. And so what happened for us is every year um, we would average, you know, 12 new businesses a month. And every year we'd have those, you know, the first year was the 12 that were renewing, the second year it's 24 renewing. So, you know, now we, we probably have upwards of, you know, anywhere from 75 to 150 businesses renewing every month. Well, some are at $60, some are at $400, some are at several thousand dollars. It's all different amounts, but what we also found was that by having a really um, low price point, it allowed people safely to come in without taking a big risk. It gave them year-round visibility. And um, a lot of our smallest businesses, and again, people put so much emphasis in, well, I'm gonna go after you know the bank or this, the people who I see having all this money. Some of our smallest advertisers that you would not have thought would up their amounts were these tiny preschools who have been our biggest advertisers because they saw a return on their investment. And so for us, we have put the same amount of energy into our customer service for the person who spends $60 with us to the person who spends $5,000 with us, so. Um, That's great. Absolutely. And and just to be clear, you don't you haven't franchised to these other cities. You are actually no. managing them. No, and even originally we didn't franchise. We chose not to franchise because when we incorporated, I was it, when you go just from a sole proprietorship to incorporating, it is just unbelievable and the amount of paperwork that you have to file every year. So then when I looked into also franchising, it not only did it make it a lot more expensive for us, it made it a lot more expensive for anyone who wanted to buy into the franchise. And that is why we ended up going the route of licensing the technology. So it actually keeps the expenses lower for you and exactly. for new ventures. So if so, so that's what we did before. So we would license the technology. So they'd pay a flat, flat rate to us and then they pay to support uh, hosting fee every month. Um, what we're doing now is we have a few of our businesses that are communities that are staying on that platform. The rest though now we actually hire as independent contractors and we pay them their commission base both um, on the sales they do and then we have a whole formula that we do paying them for content that they put into the site. Mm -hmm. So that's been a interesting one to figure out though because to manage that many people from afar and everybody's uh, work ethic and what they do is it's it's been a challenge yeah, so this is a very um, tangible way for us to be able to pay them for their work great so very, yeah. very interesting other questions can i add something about my business model and sure it's, it's, yes it's yes <laughs> um when you hear about that because i i've been asked you know what's your business model what's your business model I'm like i don't know <laughs> and um you know, one thing that i wanted to recommend what i do i really love to read books by entrepreneurs i go hear them speak so i listen to their ideas and then it, i mean for me when i finally heard about tom shoes and that he said the same thing he's like okay i'm just making it up as i go along um i've done research on on you know websites trying to look for other publishers i'm i'm not finding other companies, what you see out there with children's books is that there are new websites that are licensing books that are already written. So they're taking a scholastic book or a random house book and they're licensing them on their websites. My, my our stuff is all original art, original works. And so it's like a brand new publishing house. So a book like this 
if you have this person has this one book, but on by being able to have um, an ebook, we can have it eight different ways. So we can have this in English, French, Spanish, Chinese, and then that's um, just you can buy it just with text and illustrations, and then underneath you can buy it with audio. So you have a choice of either buying it just with text and illustrations in English or with audio, so one book can be sold eight different ways. That's great. Cool. Do you hold the exclusive rights to the publishing for those books, or can um, they still take it elsewhere? No, yeah, well, we've actually run into, you know, I'm trying to retain it because um, we do want to do a print on demand. I don't have that set up right now, mm -hmm. um, but that is a goal that if somebody wants to print a book, we'll link it. And so if somebody wants to do that, I'm saying, you know, you, we're, we're, you come to us, we're the publisher. We're, um, but the, the um, authors still retain their own copyright, so they, they do retain it. Um, so. Interesting. Cool. And now I know why my app, because I, I downloaded your app like several months ago and it doesn't work. No. Okay. Yep. So I'm trying to find out why. <laughs> Don't worry, it'll be up at some point. I went. <laughs> and so I, I assumed it was my pro I yeah. user, user problem because yeah. I'm not the best with technology. So, Other questions? Oh, good. I can ask all my questions. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to just kind of make a point. I thought it was really interesting, Melissa, the way you um, published, you self-published that book at a loss. I mean, she printed these books for $45 each. And I've heard about a lot of people when they're starting businesses needing to take those kind of risks for um, marketing. And I just wanted to, I don't know, I just wanted to commend you because I think it must be kind of, you're kind of probably freaking out. You're like, oh my God, I'm losing $45 or $25, yeah, whatever it yeah. is, every time you do it. But that's kind of what propelled you mm -hmm. to the next level. Well, seems. I had, you know, in, in a weird way, I'm lucky I lost my house. But and so instead of buying, you know, an expensive couch or new art, I decided to put it into the company. So I've been very fortunate that I haven't had to ask anyone. And I've been very frugal about the spending. Um, I did hire one woman to do some marketing for me, and in six weeks I spent more money on her than I spent on my tech guy for <laughs> then four months. I'm like, nope, I think I can do that myself. So, you know, I'm learning as I go. Um, I'm working on other jobs on the side as well. I um, do some writing, and I actually work in the writing center here at City College, so I can't say that I'm putting all my heart and soul in. I am, but I am doing other jobs as well. I was going to say too, um, when our, when we started doing it in our other communities, I was really fascinated by the number of people who took on our sites as a business and they would tell me every month and I knew they were doing sales because I saw their advertisers and they were sharing it with me and they'd say, oh, I don't have any money to do this and I don't have any money to do that. And I said, what, what are you doing with the money that comes into your business? Well, I just withdraw it every month. I mean, I made it. And I think as a business owner, you have to really be willing to invest in your own company. And um, because my husband wasn't looking at our books for the first couple of years, it took my bookkeeper when he kept joking around that this business didn't make any money saying, "Your bus her business does make money. It's just she's not taking a paycheck because she's putting it back in. And you've got to be willing to invest in your own company and to be able to give things away. And we gave a lot away and we still continue to figure out ways to give things away and we donate to the community because I think, I, I mean, that Tom's book, I, if you had a chance to hear um, Blake speak, it, it, it's wonderful. And his whole concept is actually about how do you give as a business rather than setting up yet another nonprofit. And there's so many great ways if, if you're willing to, um, take some risk and, um, and, and I guess that's part of it is you have to believe enough in yourself that mm. your own money's worth putting into your business. Well, I think it's really interesting and it seems to be the way a lot of businesses are going is that it's not, it's almost expected that you're gonna be somehow involved in the community and um, I think that the consumers are demanding it all in mm -hmm. some ways. You know, for me, um, it's it's really obvious that people um, really w come to us a lot. I mean, the first year we were in business here, we gave away more than we sold, mm -hmm. and that that's a huge amount. But that's something that we expected that we would be doing. But um, we have had to put a little bit of a cap on it because Jean Michel makes all of our chocolate by hand, and the amount of people that do come and ask for donations, we have had to learn who we who we can work with. We have to choose, pick and choose, because 
every day in both shops I have drawers of people who would like something. And even if it's a little or a lot, I get a lot of the different communities, a lot of the different um, uh, organizations that have different things going on. And we're talking 300 to 500, 600 pieces of chocolate. And you know, a small business can only do so much. Mm -hmm. But you do have to, and you, you do want to, because that's your, that's your branding and that's getting it out. And of yeah. course you want to be a part of the community as well. And so, it's helped us. I have a question for you. What do you attribute, I mean, you, you, you said it yourself, I mean, you, you opened a business during one of the biggest recessions we've had, and what do you attribute your success to? I mean, Well, um, we work on a very, very, I mean, the amount of chocolate that Jean-Michel makes every day, he makes, I would say, on, and now it's more because it's the holidays we're doing them, but on, a, on an average day, he'll make about 800 pieces of chocolate. That is Jean-Michel alone, and the first two years, we worked alone on everything. We Now, when you're making chocolate, a lot of it is freehand, but a lot of it is molds. Like the French Kiss or the, 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 Geraint, the Fleur de Lis, those are molds. Those molds, somebody has to wash those, dry those, cotton those, and if they're not done properly, when he goes to do his process again, it takes three days to make a chocolate. He'll get the, through the three-day process, and if that chocolate doesn't come out of the mold, that means that wasn't cleaned properly, wasn't dried properly. So um, the, first, uh, the first two years, we were doing everything ourselves. We were crazy. We had no dishwasher. We were doing, you know, because we had to, the money we had when we came here was from our restaurant and our house sale. We started our business not, I mean, the banks weren't touching us. The banks weren't even, they were kind of laughing, going, <laughs> didn't matter what we had, cash, they wouldn't give us anything. And so we decided we were going to do this business no matter what, and we put everything into our business. And um, so we couldn't afford a dishwashing machine in the beginning. Um, but as we grew and we gave away more and more people were coming in, we were eating a lot of bread and drinking a lot of water. You know, that's why I said, you know, you make concessions. You do what you have to do. You work and you do it all yourself if you have to. Right now Jean-Michel has got, um, in the carpentry store, he's got someone who does the dishes. We have a dishwashing machine. He's got uh, someone who's helping him now. He's a new, um, he's a student who is learning, but he would like to stay and he's a big help to Jean-Michel. Jean-Michel now is doing something <coughs> like 3,000 pieces of chocolate a day. We've got two people and three that are going to be working for the holidays in the Carpinteria store. And that's a store that there is no walk-in. It's destination. Santa Barbara store is quieter because we're, we're new. Since May, we're new and people are learning that we're there. So it's, uh, but still, you know, it's like I have one person, I have two people with me now. And for the holidays, um, after the holidays, I'll, I'll, one is just seasonal. So we do everything, you know, it's like you do. I deliver, I, I do whatever I need to do. And you and you are kind of the marketing force. I am of the, the marketing business, force, business. yes. Mm -hmm. okay. One thing I like to say is I pick up every penny I find and it definitely comes back to me many times over. So watch for those pennies. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky. <laughs> yes. Um, was it, would you say it was more difficult to start your restaurant in France or was it more difficult to start your chocolate shop? Here? You know, it wasn't hard to start it all here because we just did it. We just did it. Um, it was harder, people say because as well, people go, how did you been married for 24 years and you have worked together in restaurants and in this, but we've always worked together, lived together, worked together. Restaurant actually was easier because of the fact he had his kitchen and I had my front. So all the front things that went on was mine. All the kitchen things went on was his. Of course, you know, I got to try the new things and he came out and said, yes, I like your tablecloth, you know, but you know, this business here was a lot harder because everything we did we had to decide together that's hard that's the first time we've really had to and we've done a lot of you know bumping heads but it's it's okay you know you gotta you bump heads you figure it out you get going but uh, in answer to your question the actual business part was harder here um, just because of the situation of how we're working together you're up to 3,000 units per day Whew. Wow that's incredible yeah, and it takes three days to make a chocolate, so he's yes. always doing the process it's of three it. people. It takes well, he's done it all by himself for a long time, and now he's got—he's at least he's got somebody because he airbrushes a lot, 
So while he's airbrushing like 800 pieces, he's got his guy who can cover the others and get that going. So it's, you know. 3,000 people. That's, that's a good, that's a good he's, uh, he's good. <laughs> More questions? So any particular words of advice for students or people when they're in school, any skills they might want to learn or? Um, I, I would have two. Um, one is that, um, and I was actually the speaker this morning who re reiterated this, and um, it's to, if you're going to start a business or once you do start something, is to put to get to get a group of people together that are sharing that as a support. Um, when I first launched Parent Click, I was meeting a lot of other business owners who were relatively new business owners. And so we put together a group and we started meeting monthly. And over time, we all grew in different directions and it dissipated. But in the beginning, it was great. We had somebody to bounce ideas off of and share the, the highs and lows of it all. Um, and it was great to have those sounding boards. Um, and the other is just to never stop researching and getting information. I mean, you, you never stop learning. And there are so many great resources out there, and, I, and I'm a huge believer in um, interning and volunteering and working in different fields so that you really can get a sense of what it is before you do it, too. Love it, love it, because it's gonna be hard no matter how much you love it. It's gonna be hard. So if you don't love it, if you think, oh, you know, I love this one in the restaurant, people always go, oh, it looks so much fun, I'm gonna go open a restaurant. You know, they have no idea what goes into it. Love what you do with a passion that that's all you want to do. And it's going to be hard even with that. But you'll get through if you have the perseverance and if you love it. Um, I hand a, a sheet with some of my suggestions and some quotes. Um, another thing is really to look for people that encourage you and just be really cognizant of the people who are, I call them your naysayers, the people who want to bring you down. And you think, oh, you can't, they say, you can't do that. And you start to believe them. And so you have to really put them on the side Positive. and find the people who are going to support you. And you think those people are saying the right thing, but don't believe them. Especially in your own home. Um, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been really fortunate with that, but I've seen a lot of people who've eventually left their businesses because they couldn't handle the negative comments anymore from a spouse saying, it's never going to make it, and oh, this was a failure, and oh, you're not making money. And half the time it's because the spouse doesn't truly understand what it is you're doing and you know I dragged my husband to this thing that we went to listen to this morning and I realized that even though he's you know 5% involved in this business there's certain things that he needs to understand because he is responsible for you know at the end of the day he's part owner in it and um, he's dealing with me and um, so involve that person but you you're right you need positive people around you and you you need people who are going to be honest with you too who aren't going to just tell you what you want to hear and who are going to challenge you. And one thing that I added on my shoot sheet too is that um, a lot of people start companies and they want those angel investors and they want the big investment. Um, well, I want to retain everything for right now and I that's not my goal is to bring in this huge, you know, we were talking yeah. about the goal isn't the money, the goal is the company. So I think that's... Mm -hmm. um, one of my big things. Absolutely, keep it for you. It's your your inspiration, your baby. You need to. And if it's your money, you'll nurture it. I um, I had someone contact me two years ago who was um, had just launched a site similar to ours, and they wanted to see if you know somehow we could fit together. And at first, I was going, "Oh, great, somebody else that's doing what we're doing." And we sat down, and I actually had a ton of respect for this man, and um, he was up in Silicon Valley. And we talked a little bit about how we might be able to do some stuff and, and uh, exchanged emails and calls for about six months out of the blue. Um, and I knew how much he had already invested in this company. And he called me to tell me they were already going under. And I got together with him and I was floored. They had a programmer, they had him as the idea person and he had great ideas and they were very committed to this. And they had an angel investor who put $700,000 that they went through in two years. Oh, and when we sat down, I just said, I cannot wrap my head around this. How do you go through $700,000? And essentially it was on their salaries. And it wasn't for lack of commitment, but the angel investor got tired of waiting. They're, they all, both had different ideas at this point of philosophy of where they wanted to see this business going. And 
he said to me at that time, he said, you know, that's the mentality up in the Silicon Valley. People expect to invest in something. They don't really expect a return on it. And, and to me, you don't go into, you know, there's all kinds of different arguments out there. But to me, if you're going to go into business and you're going to take that risk, both financially and time-wise and everything else, um, put your own sweat into it, put your own money into it, because I think you'll work that much harder for it. And um, and it feels good at the end of the day that you're answering to yourself and that you're Absolutely. not having to change your um, philosophy about what it is you want to do. So I, I'm going to close right here. Maybe you have a few more minutes to hang out with us and if people have individual questions. But thank you so much. Thank I really you. Really appreciate you. Thank you.